1984, I dreamed a bold dream. It was because my teacher gave me this assignment. You know the one where they ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you've only just learned about a few jobs that are out there, and you're not really sure which one you would fit into? Well, the good thing is that in 1984, a few things had happened in America. First of all, Sally Ride had flown as the first American female astronaut, and Catherine Sullivan had done a spacewalk. I had been watching. And my parents had just taken me to see the right stuff. And the Denver Museum of Natural History was bringing back all sorts of interesting information from Mariner and Viking. And so I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I made this paper mache doll. <laughs> I wasn't hopefully going to look like a ketchup bottle, but I wanted to be an astronaut. But I had other dreams. I wanted to be a teacher like my parents and my other heroine, Laura Ingalls Wilder. I loved digging in my backyard for fossils along the Front Range. I enjoyed going to Rocky Mountain National Park and exploring, and I loved looking up at the night sky. Well, no matter what, the path before me was not going to be clearly marked. I was going to have to explore with many people along the way to help me. So it started in middle school with Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan saw that spark in me that I didn't know about. Mr. Jordan had this project where we took our fruit, food waste and we put it into crock pots and we made the whole science wing smell up and then we took that food waste and we put it with yeast and we distilled it and we made ethanol to run his lawnmower. <laughs> and I loved it. And Mr. Jordan asked me if I wanted to take my eighth grade spring break and go to California and present this to other teachers and students in a program called MESA, Math, Engineering, Science Applied. Well, it meant that over my spring break, I was going to have to practice to do this speech. It meant I'd be flying to California. It meant I'd be going to Disneyland. Yes, I wanted to do that. And I gave that speech, and I saw what science could do. Science brought you together with other people that were collaborating to understand how to solve big problems. Science helped you to meet new, those new people. Science solved real problems. I wanted to be one of those scientists. Well, other people were starting to hear about my big, bold dream, and my teacher uh, brought an application to me from Martin Marietta to introduce writing an essay about why we should go to Mars. I don't remember exactly what I wrote about, but I was pretty passionate about going to Mars, although I only took second place. First place was, the first, was a trip to space camp in Huntsville. Second place was a pretty cool t-shirt from NASA. My parents knew about my dream, and so they sent me in April of 1990 to space camp. I spent the week meeting new kids from around the country that were as interested in space as I was. I got to work on simulations with them. And I came home, and I built this model of discovery. Because see, in April of 1990, discovery was taking up the Hubble Space Telescope so that we could understand more about our universe. Well, I went into high school, and I continued on the path of studying math and science. And I enjoyed multiple uh, after-school activities, but one of them included Science Olympiad. In Science Olympiad, I'd spend my Saturday afternoons up at the entomology department learning how to identify bugs. And there's some gross ones, and there's some cool ones. I also built musical instruments and talked about the physics behind them and played them at competitions. And here we are as a team taking second place at state. I went on to college, and my freshman year brought me to the Pacific Northwest at Whitman. There, in the wheat fields, I was not sure if I was going to study math or science. Well, in my freshman introductory course to geology, I decided it would be science. Because it took me outside. It allowed me to solve problems with other people and explore the world around us. And it eventually took me to the mountains outside of Yellowstone, where I mapped a last glaciation in that vicinity, 
and it took me to the southern uh, mountains in Colorado where I mapped 2.5 billion year old rocks. I love geology. I was becoming that scientist. So, like many graduating seniors from college, I had a plan. And that plan was to go teach English as a second language in Kazakhstan, <laughs> <laughs> and then return and go on to graduate school. Well, I don't get to control everything. And Kazakhstan was pulling away from Russia. And they weren't sending Peace Corps uh, participants to Kazakhstan. So now I had to come up with a new plan. I decided to stay here in Washington, go to Central Washington University, and get my teaching certification. That led me to a job at Hudson's Bay High School in Vancouver, Washington, where I started out teaching earth science to ninth graders. Ninth graders are challenging. Ninth graders are curious. Ninth graders are a lot of fun. As I continued to teach for the first two years, we started to see some things developing where students were not passing enough of their science courses to graduate. And we wanted to retain them in our, in our school because we wanted to prepare them as citizens. So we developed an astronomy class, uh, ecology class, and we hoped that this would help recover those science credits. I, I helped with the astronomy class, and my husband and I built a telescope with a six foot focal length, and I would use it for star parties in the morning and in the evening so that they could come in for extra credit. And it was in this astronomy class that one of my students asked a very important question. How do you go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what that toilet looked like. So I went home that evening, and because I really cared about this student, I really wanted her to stay in high school, I did a web search. And NASA's website brought up a very good explanation of how the toilet works in space. And on that same website, they had a ticker that said that they were hiring teachers as part of the class of 2004. I froze. This was the answer to my question. I wanted to be an astronaut, yet I enjoyed teaching. I could combine the two things I loved into one. I had to apply. So I went ahead and applied. And at first, I came down to Houston in, in the November of 2003, and I went through a week of the, uh, the interview process and all the medical tests. And I then had to wait for six months until I even got an answer. But it didn't matter, because when I had gone in and interviewed, I knew I had given my best, that I had fully shown up. And no matter if I was hired or not, I had gone after my dream. Well, as you can see, I did get hired with the class of 2004, and it was an honor to be a part of this group. But once you're hired as an astronaut, that does not mean that you are an astronaut ready to fly. You have a year and a half to two years of training before you. Training that included wilderness survival, water survival, going and learning how to fly in Pensacola in the, in the backseat of the T-34, which is the prop plane here, which then prepared me to fly in the jet uh, as a backseater. And at first, as a backseater, you're just going to do the communication. You're going to talk with the ground. But eventually, you develop the skills where you're flying the plane, you're communicating, and you're navigating. And this allows you to be ready to fly in space. It also meant lots of weekends of going in and studying on our shuttle simulators, learning those 1,500 switches and circuit breakers, learning about the systems that run the main engine, the reaction control systems, the hydraulics. And then eventually, as a team of four, you step into the motion simulator, which takes you from launch to hopefully a safe insertion into orbit and then back. But if you are familiar with the simulator community, they're not going to let it be that easy. They're going to throw at every problem that they can to see how you work as a team. And many times, you are going to fail. And as a team, you're quickly going to assess the things that went wrong, cheer each other back up, and get ready for another launch. Well, in uh, 2006, we graduated as a class and then we uh, had time to wait around and do office jobs, do further training, because we were still waiting to return the shuttle back to flight. 
in that time frame, we had our daughter, Cambria, and here you can see the telescope that we had built, and she's coming to a training event at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. In 2008, I would get another important call. My boss, Steve Lindsay, said, I'd like you to fly with the STS-131 mission. Alan Poindexter, a Navy pilot, would be our commander, and here he is, shown with the three women on my flight. Stephanie Wilson, who is already an experienced astronaut and had two flights under her belt. Naoko Yamazaki, who was one of my classmates, and myself. In addition, we would have Jim Dutton, an Air Force pilot from Eugene, Rick Mistracchio, who is also an experienced veteran, and Clay Anderson, another veteran of many flights. So, on April 5th of 2010, we walked out of the building, got into this vehicle that takes you out to the pad. We were ready for our flight. And I had been waiting for this day for a long time. In fact, if you remember back, it was exactly 20 years since 1990 that I had built the model of Discovery, and I would be launching on Discovery. Before I got into that shuttle, I looked out across the river, knowing that my family was on the other side. My parents, my husband, my daughter, the teachers I had had, the good friends I had met along the way. And I gotta tell you, walking into that shuttle it was almost a little bit easier than coming and standing up here on this stage. <laughs> well, I had a mission before me that I wanted to perform well. I didn't want any of my actions to impact my crewmates or um, to have any bad consequences. So I started out carefully in space and uh, followed all those checklists and made sure I was backing up my partners. And as the days went by, it got to become more and more smooth until it was just like we had been practicing the weeks before. Here, I'm suiting up Clay and Rick as they go out for one of their spacewalks. I was uh, the crew member inside talking to them throughout these spacewalks. Three of them, seven hours at a time. It's keeping track of all of their safety tethers, all of the hooks that are holding equipment, all the bags, all the bolt turns. It was really rewarding. This is the, the cockpit I set up. I have all those checklists floating around me. You can you can lean back in the, anywhere you want in space, so I felt like uh, just looking out the windows and watching them as I kept track of everything. And at, during one of our spacewalks, while they were underneath the truss here, I asked them to just pause because the sun was rising, and we're not going to get this moment again. I'm, an, you know, I'm never going to get that moment again. And so, as they paused, I took this photo. And I thought it captured the beauty of our engineering as well as the fragility of our Earth below. I got a chance to be with 13 people representing multiple space uh, adventures across the globe, the Japanese Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, and NASA. I set a record with four women in space. I got to see the textbook examples of geology around the world. I finally got to see the aurora, and I'm still waiting to see it here on Earth. <laughs> I got to look out of the cupola and watch the Earth go by, and I am happy to say that while I was up there, the northwest was clear, and I saw those volcanoes and can identify the cities that I love. I worked with an awesome team, a team that is my family. And this team eventually had to say goodbye to each other and prepare to return back to Earth to the other team that we love. So, on April 20th of 2010, we landed in Florida. Fifteen days later, we had accomplished our goal. I had achieved my dream. But does that mean that dreaming is over? Once you've accomplished the big one, is that it? Absolutely not. You see, the little girl that dreamed about being an astronaut, about floating in space, she's still here, and she's still dreaming, 
and she brought her family here to the, United, to the Pacific Northwest to keep those dreams going because this is a place for us, a place that inspires us. And so my wish for you, as you go to sit down at your Thanksgiving dinners or your holiday plans, is that you make those bold dreams and that you tell other people about them because you never know where the journey is going to take you. Thank you, Seattle.